Thank you uh, everyone for joining today and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, so thank you for joining us for our first Creative Speaker Series event. And I hope you're enjoying the surf rock music uh, in honor of our first guest, <laughs> Eric Rice. Uh, my name is Alistair Simpson. I'm the VP of Design here at Dropbox. And we've got a wonderful lineup curated uh, for this series over the coming year. Uh, and firstly, though, a huge thank you to the Dropbox Design Ops team who've worked incredibly hard to curate this series. Um, and we've got some amazing speakers coming up. And today we're privileged to have the talented Eric Rice from Patagonia joining us to talk about craft, innovation, and, uh, and doing what you love. And I'm, I'm really, really excited for him to share some stories around craft with us today. And I'm going to get to formal introductions in just a minute and I'll, and I'll, let, Eric, uh, I'll let Eric introduce himself. But whilst this is our first speaker series event, we are proud to use this platform to address some important topics within the community and obviously directly with our design community right now. So I first wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the terrible events of recent weeks and show support for the black community and for civil rights everywhere. Dropbox supports the Black Lives Matter movement, our black employees and the black community in this moment and always. And so the last few weeks have been incredibly tough, bringing untold devastation, pain and anger across the US and especially in the black community. And I think it's, it's incredibly important for us all to support and amplify these messages right now, as well as stand united as a design community. The black and underrepresented minority community need help from executives and company leaders. They need support from designers, teachers, family, and friends. We, as, as design organizations, we have to hire black and underrepresented talent. We need to sponsor organizations like Interact Project who are paving the way for the next generation of black designers. They need support from all of us listening to this event to <coughs> spread their voices so that they may be heard by as many people as possible. And I think it's also important that we look within our organizations and we ask ourselves the hard questions and then ensure that we're taking real actions to uphold these values. Whether we like it or not, we are all part of the system and it is time for us to look at ourselves and ask whether we're doing enough. And though, even though unintentional, I am part of the system. And whilst I've been showing support, that isn't enough. And I know I need to take more actions. And that is why I'm working with our internal diversity and design team. And we'll be making a number of pledges to the black design community by offering my time to mentor up and coming black designers. And so I'd ask you all listening, ask yourself those same hard questions. Can you turn your support into real action? Think about what you can do today, next week, and ongoing that will really help make a difference. We will have to work together to bring justice to our society, but every small and big piece of support counts. Now we have a list of resources if you search for Dropbox Design and go to our blog with ways that you can help. So please, in whatever peaceful way that you can, don't be silent, stand up, Black Lives Matter. Well said. Thanks, Eric. And so whilst this is, as I said, we're proud to use this platform to address these important topics within the design community, I do want to move on to introduce Eric Rice from Patagonia. So Eric has worked for Patagonia for the last 23 years, which is something for us, those of us in tech where the average job span is two or three years is a long time. And he's led, he's led design for breakthrough technologies that inspire adventure seekers everywhere. Many of you probably wear some of the clothes that, that he's probably designed and his team. Now he not only designs the products, which I think is really interesting and I'm, I'm hopefully gonna get into, that he also has created new environmentally friendly materials that the products are made with. So not just the thing that you wear, also what it's made with. So for the Nano Air jacket released a few years ago, Eric and team created a new synthetic fabric that had enough insulation to keep you warm in cold conditions. But at the same time, if you're working really hard, like climbing up a mountain, um, you're dumping, you can dump that heat through the fabric. And so it's extremely innovative. And now not only does he design for Patagonia for the last 23 years, he also designs outside of the office as well. He makes furniture and kitchen knives. I'm gonna ask him to send me one at the end of this. <laughs> um, it is shopping at home. 
And so Eric lives on the central coast with his wife and two boys. And so thank you, Eric, for joining us. And, and I hope you and your family are doing awesome well at this time. Yes. That's good. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of interest, like a couple of questions about just your personal climbing experience. Where's the favorite place that you've been climbing, Eric? Gosh, I think that I, I've, I've climbed all over the world. And um, I think the place that is dearest to my heart and it's in my, my backyard is Yosemite. And uh, it's one of those, yeah, it's just a, a magical place as I'm sure many of the viewers have, have been there. And uh, from a climber standpoint, it is just amazing. I can, to this day, I can remember probably 25 plus years ago, the first time that I drove into Yosemite Valley and coming down that road and around the, the corner for the first time and seeing El Cap in person was, it, it literally took my breath away. And as it got closer, I, I, it, I, I like I said, I was just taken, it just took me away. And as I stood there down in El Cap Man, I was looking up at it you know that it's big, but yeah. then when you, when you kind of look up and you see, you can pick somebody out on the wall, maybe half of the way up, and then you see how small they are. It is, uh, it, it, it just, and the thing was, is it, it was interesting because I, I just knew that I, someday I, it the first thing it, it invoked fear in me because I just looked at it because I knew that someday I would want to go up there and it is just it yeah it's magic have you have you been up there have you climbed to the top I have not climbed to the top and <laughs> okay. I, that's that's a whole nother topic that's one of my uh I've been up uh two or three times and for different reasons came down um, yeah. weather, accidents, all of those things, but it's still one of those places that is just such a dear place to me. Yeah, I can't, uh, I can't imagine, uh, I can't imagine climbing up it. I went there for the first time about 18 months ago and it's just enormous. As a non-climber, it, it just looks incredibly huge and scary. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And what about your favorite, what about your favorite overseas destination to climb, Eric? I'd say probably uh, Thailand, and it's it's for a sort of many uh, different reasons. Um, mm -hmm. It's a place that is very friendly to climb. Um, you, we we go to a place called Raleigh Beach, which mm -hmm. is just you know the perfect uh, tropical environment where you get up early in the morning and you climb for a few hours till it gets too hot, and then you swim in the ocean or read a book or just explore and then in the evening few little few more pitches of climbing and then you wait for the fishing boats to come in and pick your fish and and they cook it up for you just wonderful that sounds magical i've been to riley but again i haven't climbed there i sat on the beach and, and ate the fish uh and who, oh. who do you who do you normally climb with eric like back in the day 25 years ago in yosemite who did you normally climb with and who do you climb with today well at that time i i uh uh was working at the north face and so most of the time it was people who i worked with in design and other but then as i started going to Yosemite, you know, literally every week and the, the truck was packed up on Friday yeah. and I'd drive to Yosemite. And then I started meet, meeting people who, who lived in Yosemite, mm -hmm. um, people on search and rescue and, and, and whatnot. And we would go out climbing together and, you know, it's one of those really tight knit communities where you, uh, you make just lifelong friends. Yeah, indeed. And, uh, I can, and do you remember what you drove down to Yosemite? You said you had a truck. Do you remember what you drove back in the day down there? Yeah, um, I had a, a, a Mitsubishi uh, truck yeah. that um, I put a lot of miles on. And, uh, you know, I, ha I had the systems all ready with everything was kind of pre-packed all the time. 
<laughs> I'd imagine there's a, there's a lot of craft in that, just getting ready to knowing what you need to take and making yeah. sure you had the right gear and that you were organized. For yeah. sure. Okay. Well, that was probably a good segue into kind of the first topic I want to get into around purpose, really, uh, and craft. And I, I'd love you to talk, talk to me, talk to the audience about your early career journey and, and finding purpose in your work because you've been at Patagonia a long time in 23 years but you know you weren't always a designer at Patagonia uh and could you just talk to me about that early journey and how that sure. ties into your focus on craft and innovation yeah I, I I will and it's one of my kind of one of my favorite things to talk about because it's really fun to look sort of about the path that we all take to get where we are and I have to kind of, when I started thinking about, really thinking about what I wanted to, to do for a living, it was probably in, in high school as we all start to, as we're getting, which I was a solid, solid average student. Okay. And boy, those ac academic courses were just, I, I couldn't focus and had a lot of trouble, but the one thing that I really gravitated towards were the shop classes, whether it was, you know, that was, and it's kind of disappearing a bit in today's education, um, regretfully, but uh, those things where I had to use my hands, wood shop, metal shop, mm -hmm. auto mechanics, I found that that I could focus on because yeah. just figuring out how things work and how to make things better um, was just fascinating to me. And so when I, I got it in my head that, um, well, a design could be something for me. And I thought, well, I'd, I'd like to be an architect. I had a cousin who was an architect and real successful. So I want to be an architect. So I, when I graduated, um, I, uh, got into an architecture program and, after about a year that first year, um, I was enjoying it, but I went to visit my cousin at his architectural firm and he was showing me around and we were walking down a hallway. I mean, I can, it's so vivid. I can remember it. Those, those moments in your life that are kind of turning points. Mm -hmm. um, I walked by a room, the door was open and there were all these uh, models in there, yeah. just plastic cups, chairs, and I just kind of, you know, looked over and I said, hey, what's that? And he said, oh, that's our industrial design, our product design category. And I didn't even know what that was. I didn't know that existed. I never thought about it. And I just said, w w what is, he said, yeah, anything that architects don't design, industrial designers design. And I mean, at that moment, I was like, that's what I want to do. Yeah. And when I, I, went down to Auburn in Alabama, Auburn University. They, they have a very solid industrial design program. And once again, that focus, I, there was no problem focusing on projects that, I mean, you know, as everybody who's been in design knows that design education is a really strenuous thing, mm -hmm. but all of us loved it. I mean, we would stay up all night, days on end, until we were just silly and couldn't think straight, um, working on projects. And it was just amazing. And that was one of those things where it, that my average sort of results changed from average to, to really strong. And that once again, fueled me even more, of course. Yeah. And, and when I graduated from Auburn, I would always, you know, as you do when you're in, in school, you, you talk about well, what would be, you know, what would you like to do? And I had it in my head that I would like to go and work for a, you know, sort of a small consulting firm where you get a, a wide variety of projects. Yeah. And lo and behold, it, the, the job market was really tough uh, at that time. And I uh, just sent resumes everywhere. And banged on doors and and finally i i got a job in chicago at a small consulting firm mm -hmm. dream realized yeah. and uh and i went there and 
it it was interesting it was a good variety of products and for a while that did fuel me and it uh but after a while also it started to it started to build in my head about the need to design things that are necessary that um you know and i i guess i i would say that the thing that that broke the straw that broke the camel's back was I remember it the the last project I worked on was a Bart Simpson telephone and <laughs> is it still in production I, you know I I don't know <laughs> <laughs> probably not okay. um Let's and but I but I remember well he was standing on a skateboard and he had the, the receiver of the phone in his hand mm -hmm. and uh so but that one was kind of the the deal breaker because it was nobody needs this and we're creating all this stuff that where does it go well we know where it goes it goes into a landfill and that you know and it, so that started to bother me and and literally on that project after i finished that quad project um i i left um chicago and i went back home to michigan and i worked on uh uh, some consulting projects while I was looking for something else. And I, I got a job setting up a uh, festival tents. I was a carny. Um, <laughs> so swinging a 20 pound sledgehammer um, in the middle of summer in Michigan um, was healthy in different ways. But uh, after a while, a friend of mine called me and he said, Hey, he, he knew that I was a climber because I started climbing when I was in design school. And he uh, said to me, hey, I saw a, a North Face store is opening here um, close to our hometown and uh, they're looking for an assistant manager. And I thought, heck, I, I should go talk to these people. And I had absolutely no retail experience. I had never worked in a retail store, but I, there, in Michigan, there weren't many climbers. And I, met with the manager of the store and uh, sort of he knew my passion for the outdoors. Um, and so I got that job and I, even in that interview, I said, you know, my ideal sort of career path would be if I could move into design someday for the North Face. And he said, sure, you're, you're w welcome to try that. It's not something that happens too often, but go for it. And I said, I, I, yes. So I took that job and after about a, and it was, you know, it's one of those things where you never realize how much you're learning when you're doing something that's not your goal, but yeah. um, talking to people about what they want and problems that they're having with their gear. So after about a, probably about a year and a half of doing that, which when you're young is a long time doing what you supposedly don't want to be doing. Um, the, the manager of that store moved on and they asked me to be, to be the manager of the store. And I said, you know, well, gosh, I, I have to be honest. I, I don't really want to do this, but I will take it. But know that if I, if something opens up in design, I am going to want to go after that. And they said, absolutely do that. And so anytime that I would go out to the headquarters on the other side of the country out in, uh, at the time, Berkeley, California, um, I would meet with the owner, show him my portfolio, just really nagged him. And probably, and something did open up and probably just from him wanting to shut me up, um, he gave me the job and it was, it was in apparel design yeah. for the North Face, you know, climbing clothing and skiing clothing, which I knew nothing about. And for some reason he hired me for that. And so I moved out to California and uh, I was lucky to have so many people around me, so many people who had so much experience to bring me along about pattern making and garment design. And, you know, I was going over to Asia at the time for or for, for these trips to go to factories and see how things are built. And uh, in between 
going climbing in Yosemite, as I talked about every weekend. Yeah. And that once again, dream realized, you know, now yeah. I'm, I'm designing things that I'm really passionate about. Yeah. And, and then it, it just clicked with me that, wow, that's important too. Not yeah. only just design, but something that has meaning to you as a designer. Yeah, I love the, I love the, you know, how you went into, you know, retail, which wasn't, you know, your goal, but essentially what it sounds like what you're doing as well was getting really close to the customers who were using the products and understanding where the, where the clothing wasn't working or was working for them. So you were building up your knowledge, which I would guess would have helped, you know, other than being a climber yourself. Um, you know, will help when you start designing these things for the North Face. Um, so yeah. I love that journey you know, into passion, you know, taking, it's not a linear path, so taking like kind of a diversion. Take, I just want to take you back a little bit, Eric. You mentioned, you know, you moved into industrial design uh, for college. Like what, like maybe what was one of your favorite projects that you designed, if you can remember at, at college, but also, you know, what were some of the, the key lessons you learned there from some of your, your pr teachers or professors, I guess as they would probably be called? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the industrial design program at Auburn, it was a small program as many design programs are, which was such a treat to have so much sort of one-on-one -on -one time with your professors. And, and one of the professors that I had was uh, a Swiss guy, Dr. Walter Scher, and <laughs> he was a character. He, uh, he came out of the Ohm School of Design, which was a, a branch of, uh, off of the, uh, the Bauhaus School mm -hmm. of Design. So a very methodology-based method, design sort of program. And he, uh, gosh, there's so many quotes from him that are, you know, he was the terror. You could, you'd, you didn't get your, your time with Dr. Cher until probably your, the end of your second year, beginning of your third year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so you'd be sitting in your studio and in the next room you'd hear screaming and coming out. And it, you knew it was Wally, Dr. Walter Cher, you know, tearing somebody's model apart or, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, just, and it, it was all those things were just so amazing because it, then when you, when you got the, the, almost I would call it the privilege of being underneath him and learning from him, you would just see sort of the discipline that, that good design really takes. And he uh, would, uh, I'm trying to think of you said, you know, what kind of memorable things. Um, yeah, I guess one of the most memorable things would be, you know, I'd be working on a project and one of you said, oh, you asked me what one of the most memorable products was. And I, I designed a, uh, a uh, handheld water purifier for backpacking. Huh. And uh, at that time, there weren't that many of them. Now there's, you know, a dozen or more out there. And, but it was more in its infancy at that time. And so there are a few out there. And I thought that you know, they they were some somewhat cumbersome, and it'd be nice to be able to once again design something that I was really passionate about. So, after you know, doing many versions of sketches and some quick foam models of things, and thinking that I was on that, ah, I've got it here. This is going to be a good direction. And he would come in and you know, kind of shake his head, oh, Mr. Rice. You know, just <laughs> you know, whether it was. Uh, drawing right on the rendering that I'd spent, you know, a couple days working on and getting polished or um, accidentally uh, bumping the, the latest model off the desk and having it shatter on the floor and him looking surprised, you know, faking, oh gosh, you know, but he, he, he said to me, you know, Mr. Rice, care, but don't become attached. And that was something that I, I think of that all the time. And I, I say it all the time because it's such a good lesson. We, in design, we tend to, a lot of times when we get a project, we have an idea immediately of a possible solution. But in reality, 
it's often not the best solution. Mm. It is something that we have to be prepared. It's, it's fine to go down that initial, oh, here's an idea I have and go down the road. But when you start learning more and things maybe you see a, a possible better way, we have a tendency to, no, 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 this, is, this was my initial idea. I wanna, yeah, it, care, but don't become attached. Yeah, I love that, that care, but don't become attached. I think that's that's a wonderful lesson to learn as a young designer or as any yeah. designer, actually. Like, you know, we all often forget that, you know, we, as you said, we become attached to our solutions that we've, that we've lovingly created. Yeah. Uh, and it's, I guess that it's probably, a, you know, as we talk about, you know, moving through your design career, you, you've had 23 years as a designer at Patagonia, which is, you know, a long stint. You're obviously still passionate about what you do there which is obviously wonderful. You talked about how you gained that passion from doing something that you love. But now that you've been there 23 years uh, and you've been you know, creating apparel and, and clothing for that length of time, as a designer, what, what's become so intuitive and instinctive to you that you just no longer notice? It's things that you, you know, just do that other people that you work with just don't see anymore. Yeah. Well, I think a couple things. One, the first is probably the age-old uh, design saying or philosophy of form follows function. Um, okay. That's yeah. something that it, at, at Patagonia is very, very important, obviously. Our products have to work. Um, they can be aesthetically beautiful, but if you uh if you if they don't work then it's going to be you know at the best the somebody is going to be dissatisfied yeah. at the worst they're going to get hurt or lose their life so it's it's one of those things that um form follows function it it just it's we don't even really bring it up anymore because everybody knows that it, in design mm. and uh yeah, it's, and this is another one that Yvonne, the, the owner, the founder and owner of Patagonia, Yvonne Chouinard, he, he often uh, talks about the Zen archer and how the Zen archer doesn't aim at the target. The Zen archer does everything perfectly in preparation before releasing the arrow. And if everything is done perfectly, you will reach your goal. And of course, in design, if you do, if a product meets all of its goals perfectly, it will also be beautiful. You don't have to, it, it will speak for itself and be beautiful, beautiful through its uh, design language. Yeah, that's, uh, again, such a simple reminder of, you know, form follows function, right? And, uh, yeah. and it's, is there a, you, you discuss there, um, you know, those, those key kind of things that you have at Patagonia. Are there any other, uh, like, key kind of principles that you live by uh, in yeah. the design team, team there? Yeah, absolutely. And it's one that we, we're at the point now where, we also, we don't even have to discuss it. Nobody has to say, say it, anything, mm. but that's the environmental impacts of everything we make. Uh, yeah. Because at Patagonia, we have a new mission statement and that's, uh, we are in business to save our home planet. Mm. Simple to say, hard to execute, yeah. but it goes from everything in a product when for instance one of one of the first things that we do when we get a project is we start thinking okay what are we going to make this out of mm. a a jacket for instance um so of course you have to go and meet with fabric vendors well in the past 10 years ago or something like that we would talk we would we would talk with our fabric vendors and we would build a fabric to meet the goals of the project. And how can we best do that? And we'd come up with something. And then as 
sort of a secondary thought always, we would say, okay, so how can we make this out of recycled fabrics now? Mm. Or excuse me, recycled materials to come. Mm. And now we have it so ingrained with all our, our vendors, our partners, they really don't even consider showing us things that don't have that environmental aspect. So it doesn't even come up. Um, the only thing that may come up is, uh, it, is how we can lessen it. Even if it's something is 100% made from recycled materials, it still has environmental impact. Um, mm -hmm. Converting the, uh, the petroleum into an actual fabric, all of those things. So how do we lessen that? And even if we build something from 100% recyclable materials that then we can recycle again, there, is, there does come a time when it will um, have an end of life. And we're looking very closely at that. What do we do about that? And I mean, the ideal thing, and if you look at cotton um, production, uh, for years and years, we were, using or we were using cotton. And then we started to realize that Growing cotton is a very is very detrimental to the soil. You only have so many cycles, so many crops that you can go through before the soil is no is no longer able to grow cotton. So what we did is we decided we're going to change everything to organic cotton, which was a really big deal because it, at the time, this was years ago, there weren't a lot of people producing organic cotton. And everybody was saying, you know, gosh, it's going to be so expensive that um, we just, we won't be able to aff make affordable products. And the answer to that from Yvonne was, we won't make cotton then. We won't make cotton products if we cannot figure out how to do this. And lo and behold, we did figure out how to do it. And now, so we've been doing that for years. And we also realized that even in organic farming, that the soil slowly degrades. Yeah. And the problem is, is because it's a monocrop, the way that it's grown most of the time. So now we're doing a big push on regenerative cotton. Mm -hmm. And that is the soil actually gets better yeah. by growing different crops seasonally in the same place and that's something that we're, we're getting growers to do that as well on a small scale, but it's going to grow. Yeah. And the goal is to eventually have all cotton be regenerative cotton. That's so fair. it's one of those things that it's not just good enough to ha say how little of an impact can you have? The goal should be, how do we make things better? Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. every day, in, yeah, every day in life, everything we do has an impact on the earth. Yeah. And that's something that we have to figure out. Yeah. I love how, you know, it stems from the mission statement, you know, we're in business to save the planet. Yeah. And then, but then also stems from having a founder that will make those strong decisions to say, well, if we can't figure out, you know, cotton, organic cotton, then we won't use it. So there's, right. there's some, there's some great threads there. And then how you think about the ecosystem of your suppliers, it's not just, you know, the products you're building and then how do you, you know, create that into a loop rather than just, you know, it has an end of life. I'm just going to prompt in about 10 minutes, we're going to take questions from the audience. So if you, if you're on the chat, then please, uh, please submit some questions. I've got a couple in here already that, that I'll, I'll follow on with, but in about 10 minutes, we'll take some questions from there. But that, that thinking about that ecosystem kind of moves me on to this topic around resiliency really in craft. And I think as we've seen with, you know, the, the ongoing global pandemic with, with COVID-19, too many of the systems that we designed are, are just fragile or well, they simply yeah. don't work. So for example, when it started, the USA couldn't manufacture enough ventilators, you know, to support the need. And, and so Patagonia though has been able to be resilient during these times. And you just talked about some of those topics, I think, but what lessons do you have about, you know, designing resilient systems, you know, versus something that might just look you know, beautiful, but could be fragile. And then how do you get better at designing in a systemic way? Well, I think that one of the most important things, and this once again goes back to 
um, Dr. Walter Scher in, yeah. in my design school days is he was coming from that Ohm School of Design, Bauhaus School of Thought was design methodology and the importance of design methodology. And a lot of times uh, designers kind of, I guess, trivialize design methodology or systems of design because, oh, that just, you know, that bogs you down and you can't be real creative. But um, Dr. Cher always used to say, it's, it's the opposite of that. If you have your design systems or your design methodology in place and it becomes second nature, first you do this, then you do this. This is how you gather information. This is how you do research. Um, then you, it frees you. That's sort of, that was the joke that it's the opposite methodology systems free you up to be creative because you're not mm -hmm. spending time chasing your tail and going down avenues that may not be the right ones. So if all, if you, if you are very systematic in your design, it just frees you up. Yeah. That's again, it's a, a wonderful, uh, I guess, push back to traditional, values of design and how you think about you know form follows function care but don't get attached and, and yeah think systemically because those systems can become flexible they can become like the kind of it can be a steel rod but then things can move and flex around that um, right is it when you uh, i mentioned you know this this jacket that you created uh with new technology how did you think about that from a systems point of view when you were creating the fabric was it like, did you have to go back to square one? Were you thinking about, how are you thinking about your customer? How are you thinking about the ecosystem around it? You just talk us through like the process of it. Yeah. Um, so the big breakthrough with the, the Nano Air Jacket was that it was truly breathable. Uh, a high loft insulation that was truly breathable. We, in, in the past, we had, we had heard about things being breathable. And you'd use these so-called breathable um, garments and you'd realize that, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, dry on the outside, but geez, on the inside of my system, I'm soaking wet. Hmm. And so we started really thinking about that and the crux of designing a insulated garment that's breathable is the insulation if, if, the, if air is passing through the fabric that means it has to be relatively open um, and when it's open uh, insulation can migrate through the fabric and you have a mess on your hands and so the the crux of this was working with a vendor um, to get an insulation that if we opened the fabric up would not migrate out mm -hmm. and we, we did that, and as soon as we started using this stuff, we knew we were really, really onto something because you could put it on and keep it on. Um, and it was, if you were moving fast in the mountains and you didn't need protection from snow, rain, whatever it might be, you just wore this, you know, the nano air jacket. And then if, the weather really went south and you started getting wet, you can put a shell on over that. And even though there is going to be moisture inside, maybe on the outside of your insulative layer and the inside of your outer shell, you still felt dry. Mm -hmm. And that was just one of those epiphanies that, gosh, I, I can put this on and leave it on all day. And that was a real change. And uh, I think that in that we sort of started a revolution and other people now are doing it as well, but it, uh, it sure is fun to be a part of something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe that, you know, maybe that leads to here. It's like, it's, it, maybe that's not, but what are you most proud of as a designer, Eric? Like as a designer at Patagonia, what are you most proud of? Well, um, there's things on, on kind of different levels. You know, one of the, uh, 
that nano air project was, and I should say it wasn't, it, that's not something that, that's not a Eric Rice design, that's a Patagonia design. Yeah. Uh, because um, there were, I can't even count how many people involved in that project. There were a number of designers, there were a number of product developers, there were a number of marketers, there were, I mean, there were so many eyes on that project that um, it wouldn't have happened with just one person, two people. Um, it, uh, so it was definitely a team effort. And then of course, the ones that, you know, just make me feel good that it, when I'm out and about is when I see something I designed, you know, a, a down sweater or something like that. Um, you know, that feels good as well to know that I was a part of that also. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, it must be nice to see your, your products out in the world. You know, many people probably listening are digital designers, which is a different way of seeing your products out in the world. But yeah. It must be something quite nice about seeing the physical products on people. Uh, and and uh, have you had any interesting moments where you've told people that you designed what they were wearing? And they, they uh, were like, really? Yeah, it's fun. It's, uh, you can get, you can, uh, get a couple of different sp responses on that. And of course, the one that uh, feels great is when you see somebody wearing something and you say, oh yeah, I work for Patagonia, I, you know, riding, riding on a chairlift or something. And you say, uh, what do you think about those? And, and they say, I love these things. I wear them. But then there are other times they say, ah, this darn thing, you know, it, it pulls here or, you know, it, first time I wore it, it tore or, you know, so it's, it, you, you have to be careful what you, you gotta yeah. uh, be careful what you ask, but yeah, that's uh, right. it's, it's a, it's a really, it's a really fun way to just engage people and learn a lot about the products that you're designing is talk to people who are using them, of course. Yeah. I, again, a, such a simple lesson, right? It's something that again, we can often forget is just getting close to our customers and talking to our customers and yeah. hearing from them about what's working and what's not. Uh, um, Going back to, uh, uh, we've got a, a question, but I want to go back to the, the analogy you made of the Zen Archer. Uh, like you said, like if you get everything prepared, just to re remind people, you get everything prepared in the right way perfectly, then you will hit your goal. Like, what does that mean to you? Like as a designer, like what needs to be set up perfectly and, and how do you help define that either for yourself or for your team? Yeah, I think it's, it's really, it's important to, first of all, make sure that the, the goal is well-defined. You know, if it's, a, if it's a jacket, you can't just say, okay, this is gonna, guys, I want you to design a waterproof breathable jacket. You have to, in certain instances, say if it's a, you know, a, a, a jacket that is gonna be used for, for uh, ice climbing or something like that, you have to really know the conditions and what's expected of the project. That's one of the most important things because a lot of times we go into projects and we get so far and then we, we can realize that, ah, uh, that's not exactly what we want. And so it's, it's really important for um, people who oversee the design and also people who oversee the business, of course, to really well define what the project is. Because if you know what you're designing for, then you can, you can figure out solutions and how to test it. So that's what's really, really important is to, to have a really solid, detailed design brief. Yeah, okay. That's uh, again, yeah, like, uh... You know, making sure you're clear, as you said, on the, what is the goal? What is the problem that you're trying to solve? Like, yeah. making sure you have that design brief in place. And uh, is, how do, again, I'm just interested, how does that work at Patagonia? Like, you know, in a, in a short nutshell, how does that design brief work when you're building apparel or products? Well, um, it, it's interesting because uh, it's a really, really collaborative environment and that that we work in and quite honestly that's not for everybody some people like to sort of mire in you know this this is uh i'm doing this project and that can be very satisfying but 
I found that the the old uh, two heads is better than one uh, really applies to design. And it's, you know, design uh, works with the product line managers who are the, the ones that are in charge of the, the business side. Um, uh, a bit of figuring out what kind of products we need, but design also, you know, we come at it from a different perspective, knowing uh, really intimately what sort of, what is possible in design. Because sometimes there are times that um, people don't know even that something is possible, so it can really Im improve upon a, an experience. So that's what design can bring. Um, but it's, it's business people, working with uh, design. And by the time we have sort of our, our line plan finalized, that, that due date on the calendar, there's nobody in design or line planning that doesn't know what's already gonna be on there because we've been working so closely together on it. Um, so it's not just one person or one department building that line plan. It's a collaboration of people building it and of course that always works better when, because then everybody's on board too. Yeah. Um, and really truly understands the product. It's like when a design brief is built, um, there aren't any surprises on there because we've all worked on it together to yeah. build it. Okay, yeah, that's great. And uh, I'm gonna take a question from, uh, from someone anonymous, uh, but how does, how does Patagonia stay true to its principles while you know, obviously it's becoming a much more popular brand, especially in the last few years. Yeah. Well, I think that <laughs> we're lucky because we're a private company. Mm. There's uh, one person or one family uh, who has a vision and they are uncompromising on that vision. And, you know, uh, uh, people, friends of mine and, uh, and whatnot are also saying, well, Patagonia, they're getting bigger and they're popular. And you're saying, you know, that uh, we have to have less impact, but you're making more stuff. And how do you justify that? Yeah. Well, the, the thing is one, make the best product that lasts the longest amount of time. Cause you know, when, what the best thing that you can do with say an automobile people are all switching to, to hybrids and electric vehicles, which is great, but driving the same car for as long as you can is the way to have the least amount of impact. So designing those types of products, but um, like I say, we're lucky that we have founders that hold dearly the, the mission statement and uh, are willing to just stick very closely to that. And the more people that Patagonia sort of gets to be loyal Patagonia customers, the more they will listen to, to sort of um, what we have to say as far as uh, environmentalism. And the more people we get like that, that we can move it in the right direction. And that's really the goal. Yeah. I, I, I mean, my own Patagonia anecdote is I got the products are made so you can, they can be fixed. They can be repaired. Right. And so I had a yeah. water, waterproof jacket fixed, but then the lining actually started um, peeling and, and Patagonia recycled it and then replaced it for me, which was, you know, it was great customer care. I'd had that jacket for a long time, but yeah. they, they still, they were like, I oh, will take it back. We'll recycle it. It will go back into making more products. Absolutely. I mean, they all have a lifetime warranty and we, we urge people that that's the, the first thing is to try and repair it. And even part of design now, you talked about, so what are those things you don't even think about? Well, one of the design things that's really important to us is to design garments that are easy to repair. And the way things go together um, dictates how easy or hard they are to repair. And uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting to think about, you know, a brand new jacket is nice, but it's also really nice to wear a down jacket that you've had for 20 years and patches on the, the arm, 
where you got too close to the campfire and it burned a hole in it and you, you put a patch on it and you always remember where that happened. And each little scrape or bump or tear that you fixed is a memory yeah. and it's an experience. And it's, I love it more than anything else when people say, I don't want this garment replaced, repair it. And sometimes we don't have the exact same fabric or the same color. So we sort of celebrate that. And people love, you know, they, they have a blue jacket with a red patch on it or a pair of surf trunks that have a, you know, different color, a different print as the patch. Yeah. And it shows people that you've been using those garments for what they were intended to be used for and that they're, they're real. Yeah. Well, there's that, you know, those experiences I think are so important, right? You know, memories you said, right. You know, that's what yeah. the product should be kind of giving us. Um, and you know, those, that, that's what we need to hold dear, I think, versus just, you know, a new product. Um, oh, yeah. You know, so, owning the same car for so many years. Like I remember my dad had the same car for years and years and he loved it. And, uh, yeah. and his dad as well. And they, you know, would polish it and clean it every weekend. They were so proud. Um, I just want to, I want to move to, we've got just a few minutes, but um, Patagonia, you know, if anybody's read the book, Let My People Go Surfing by the founder, uh, the book title is around we shouldn't work nine to five. If there's a good swell, people should be able to go and, go and surf the swell, right? Let my yeah. people go surfing. But it's famous for its policy around flexible work, which is obviously in today's climate, you know, super important. Uh, can you just talk to me about, you know, the importance of that flexible work over the last 23 years in relation to your craft and, you know, purpose yep. for the people that work there? Absolutely. And uh, it's, I think the most important part of that to be successful is to hire people who have a passion for what they're doing and also, you know, responsible people, because that's one of the, the uh, philosophies there that the, the goal or the expectation is to get the job done. Um, so you have to set up uh, goals so people really understand what's expected of them, but, how that gets done isn't that important. If, you know, if the surf's up, if you go surfing and then you need to work late into the night because you went surfing, then do that. Or if it's a powder day, you know, you can't, you can't time those things. You can't turn it on when you want. So you have to be able to go when the conditions are right, but the work still has to get done. So, that's, uh, that's a really important thing. And people also in our environment, we have passionate people that love doing what they're doing and they have to be able to do it to do their best work. If you're not climbing, if you're not skiing, if you're not surfing, mountain biking, trail running, fly fishing, you, you can do all the studying in the world and interview people in, you know, focus groups and all that kind of stuff. But you're not going to get the answers there. I mean, there, there's time and place for that, but nothing beats going out, getting on a river, you know, catching fish, spending time out there. So you experience it yourself and are surrounded by people that are also go out fishing for the day, come back and sit by the campfire and you will hear what was working, what wasn't working. Um, it's, it's great. And, one of the most satisfying things is um, if you send something out to be tested and then when the person who is testing it, you say, you know, well, what, do you, what did you think about the jack? Did it breathe enough? Did it, did it pull when you were climbing underneath the arm? All these things. The best response you can get is, I didn't think about it. I didn't even know it was there. That's the, that's the goal. And I mean, nothing could be better. You don't, you, you, you don't go outside to, to think about your clothing. You go outside to enjoy it, to challenge yourself. Yeah, I love that. That's probably, you know, we're, at, we're just about at time, but I love that probably to end on is just, you know, great design you don't even notice because it just, you know, the form and the function exactly. are just perfect. And, you know, I, I just want to thank you, Eric, for sharing some lessons. I was just taking a couple of notes, you know, some great, Great lessons for us all, you know, care, but don't get attached, you know, form always follows function, you know, yeah. 
get get close to your customers and follow your passion and then think about you know mission and values uh as as really core um and then think about experiences versus you know and how do you regenerate and give people experiences versus just you know buying one-off things so there's some wonderful lessons that you've shared with us all um with us today eric and i i appreciate you spending the time with us and uh Thank you to everyone that's joined in online. We didn't get to all of the questions, but we, we certainly answered, asked and answered a few of the questions that came in, but thank you to those that answered questions. Uh, again, thank you to the, the design ops team at Dropbox for putting this together. I appreciate you all and uh, stay safe. Have a wonderful weekend. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you, Eric. Thank you, my pleasure. It was fun. Perfect. Thank you so much.